Book Two, Chapters Ten through Twelve of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One, by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book Two, Chapters Ten through Twelve. Chapter Ten. How Moses Made War with the Ethiopians Moses, therefore, when he was born, and brought up in the foregoing manner, and came to the age of maturity, made his virtue manifest to the Egyptians, and showed that he was born for the bringing them down, and raising the Israelites. And the occasion he laid hold of was this. The Ethiopians, who were next neighbors to the Egyptians, made an inroad into their country, which they seized upon, and carried off the effects of the Egyptians, who, in their rage, fought against them, and revenged the affronts they had received from them. But being overcome in battle, some of them were slain, and the rest ran away in a shameful manner, and by that means saved themselves. Whereupon the Ethiopians followed after them in the pursuit, and thinking that it would be a mark of cowardice if they did not subdue all Egypt, they went on to subdue the rest with greater vehemence and when they had tasted the sweets of the country, they never left off the prosecution of the war. And as the nearest parts had not courage enough at first to fight with them, they proceeded as far as Memphis, and the sea itself, while not one of the cities was able to oppose them. The Egyptians, under this sad oppression, betook themselves to their oracles and prophecies, and when God had given them this counsel, to make use of Moses the Hebrew, and take his assistance, the king commanded his daughter to produce him, that he might be the general of their army. Upon which, when she made him swear he would do him no harm, she delivered him to the king, and supposed his assistance would be of great advantage to them. She withal reproached the priest, who, when they had before admonished the Egyptians to kill him, was not ashamed now to own their want of his help. So Moses, at the persuasion both of Thermothus and the king himself, cheerfully undertook the business, and the sacred scribes of both nations were glad, those of the Egyptians, that they should at once overcome their enemies by his valor, and that by the same piece of management Moses would be slain, but those of the Hebrews, that they should escape from the Egyptians, because Moses was to be their general. But Moses prevented the enemies, and took and led his army before those enemies were apprised of his attacking them for he did not march by the river, but by land, where he gave a wonderful demonstration of his sagacity. For when the ground was difficult to be passed over, because of the multitude of serpents, which it produces in vast numbers, and, indeed, is singular in some of those productions, which other countries do not breed, and yet such as are worse than others, in power and mischief, and in general fierceness of sight, some of which ascend out of the ground unseen, and also fly in the air, and so come upon men at unawares, and do them a mischief. Moses invented a wonderful stratagem to preserve his army safe and without hurt. For he made baskets, like unto arks, of sedge, and filled them with ibes, and carried them along with them. Which animal is the greatest enemy to serpents imaginable? For they fly from them when they come near them. And as they fly, they are caught and devoured by them, as if it were done by the hearts but the Ibes are tame creatures, and only enemies to the serpentine kind. But about those Ibes I say no more at present, since the Greeks themselves are not unacquainted with this sort of bird. As soon, therefore, as Moses was come to the land which was the breeder of these serpents, he let loose the Ibes, and by their means repelled the serpentine kind, and used them for his assistance before the army came upon that ground. When he had therefore proceeded thus on his journey, he came upon the Ethiopians before they expected him, and, joining battle with them, he beat them, and deprived them of the hopes they had of success against the Egyptians, and went on in overthrowing their cities, and indeed made a great slaughter of these Ethiopians. Now when the Egyptian army had once tasted of this prosperous success, by the means of Moses, they did not slacken their diligence, insomuch that the Ethiopians were in danger of being reduced to slavery, 
and all sorts of destruction, and at length they retired to Seba, which was a royal city of Ethiopia, which Cambyses afterwards named Mero, after the name of his own sister. The place was to be besieged with very great difficulty, since it was both encompassed by the Nile quite round, and the other rivers, Astapus and Astaborus, made it a very difficult thing for such as attempted to pass over them, for the city was situated in a retired place, and was inhabited after the manner of an island, being encompassed with a strong wall, and having the rivers to guard them from their enemies, and having great ramparts between the wall and the rivers, insomuch that when the waters came with the greatest violence, it can never be drowned, which ramparts make it next to impossible for even such as are gotten over the rivers to take the city. However, while Moses was uneasy at his armies lying idle, for the enemies durst not come to a battle, this accident happened. Tharbis was the daughter of the king of the Ethiopians. She happened to see Moses as he led the army near the walls, and fought with great courage, and admiring the subtlety of his undertakings, and believing him to be the author of the Egyptians' success, when they had before despaired of recovering their liberty, and to be the occasion of the great danger the Ethiopians were in, when they had before boasted of their great achievements, she fell deeply in love with him, and upon the prevalency of that passion, sent to him the most faithful of all her servants to discourse with him about their marriage. He thereupon accepted the offer, on condition she would procure the delivering up of the city, and gave her the assurance of an oath to take her to his wife, and that when he had once taken possession of the city, he would not break his oath to her. No sooner was the agreement made, but it took effect immediately, and when Moses had cut off the Ethiopians, he gave thanks to God, and consummated his marriage, and led the Egyptians back to their own land. Chapter 11 How Moses Fled Out of Egypt into Midian Now the Egyptians, after they had been preserved by Moses, entertained a hatred to him, and were very eager in compassing their designs against him, as suspecting that he would take occasion from his good success to raise a sedition and bring innovations into Egypt, and told the king he ought to be slain. The king had also some intentions of himself to the same purpose, and this as well out of envy at his glorious expedition at the head of his army, as out of fear of being brought low by him and being instigated by the sacred scribes, he was ready to undertake to kill Moses. But when he had learned beforehand what plots there were against him, he went away privately, and because the public roads were watched, he took his flight through the deserts, and where his enemies could not suspect he would travel. And, though he was destitute of food, he went on, and despised that difficulty courageously. And when he came to the city Midian, which lay upon the Red Sea, and was so denominated from one of Abraham's sons by Keturah, he sat upon a certain well, and rested himself there after his laborious journey, and the affliction he had been in. It was not far from the city, and the time of the day was noon, where he had an occasion offered him by the custom of the country, of doing what recommended his virtue, and afforded him an opportunity of bettering his circumstances. From that country having but little water, the shepherds used to seize on the wells before others came, lest their flocks should want water, and lest it should be spent by others before they came. There were now come, therefore, to this well seven sisters that were virgins, the daughters of Ragel, a priest, and one thought worthy by the people of the country of great honor. These virgins, who took care of their father's flocks, which sort of work it was customary and very familiar for women to do in the country of the Troglodytes, they came first of all, and drew water out of the well in a quantity sufficient for their flocks, into troughs, which were made for the reception of that water. But when the shepherds came upon the maidens, and drove them away, that they might have the command of the water themselves, Moses, thinking it would be a terrible reproach upon him if he overlooked the young women under unjust oppression, and should suffer the violence of the men to prevail over the right of the maidens, he drove away the men, who had a mind to more than their share, and afforded a proper assistance to the women, 
who, when they had received such a benefit from him, came to their father, and told him how they had been affronted by the shepherds, and assisted by a stranger, and entreated that he would not let this generous action be done in vain, nor go without a reward. Now the father took it well from his daughters that they were so desirous to reward their benefactor, and bid them bring Moses into his presence, that he might be rewarded as he deserved. And when Moses came, he told him what testimony his daughters bare to him, that he had assisted them, and that, as he admired him for his virtue, he said that Moses had bestowed such his assistance on persons not insensible of benefits, but where they were both able and willing to return his kindness, and even to exceed the measure of his generosity. So he made him his son, and gave him one of his daughters in marriage, and appointed him to be the guardian and superintendent over his cattle, for of old all the wealth of the barbarians was in those cattle. Chapter 12 Concerning the Burning Bush and the Rod of Moses now Moses, when he had obtained the favor of Jethro, for that was one of the names of Ragel, stayed there and fed his flock. But some time afterward, taking his station at the mountain called Sinai, he drove his flocks thither to feed them. Now this is the highest of all the mountains thereabout, and the best for pasturage, the herbage being there good. And it had not been before fed upon, because of the opinion men had that God dwelt there, the shepherds not daring to ascend up to it. And here it was that a wonderful prodigy happened to Moses. For a fire fed upon a thorn bush, yet did the green leaves and the flowers continue untouched, and the fire did not at all consume the fruit branches, although the flame was great and fierce. Moses was affrighted at this strange sight, as it was to him. But he was still more astonished when the fire uttered a voice, and called to him by name, and spake words to him, by which it signified how bold he had been in venturing to come into a place whither no man had ever come before, because the place was divine, and advised him to remove a great way off from the flame, and to be contented with what he had seen. And though he were himself a good man, and the offspring of great men, yet that he should not pry any further. And he foretold to him, that he should have glory and honor among men, by the blessing of God upon him. He also commanded him to go away thence with confidence to Egypt, in order to his being the commander and conductor of the body of the Hebrews, and to his delivering his own people from the injuries they suffered there. For, said God, they shall inhabit this happy land which your forefather Abraham inhabited, and shall have the enjoyment of all good things. But still he enjoined them, when he brought the Hebrews out of the land of Egypt, to come to that place, and to offer sacrifices of thanksgiving there. Such were the divine oracles which were delivered out of the fire. But Moses was astonished at what he saw, and much more at what he heard. And he said, I think it would be an instance of too great madness, O Lord, for one of that regard I bear to thee, to distrust thy power, since I myself adore it, and know that it has been made manifest to my progenitors. But I am still in doubt how I, who am a private man, and one of no abilities, should either persuade my own countrymen to leave the country they now inhabit, and to follow me to a land whither I lead them, or, if they should be persuaded, how I can force Pharaoh to permit them to depart, since they augment their own wealth and prosperity by the labors and works they put upon them. But God persuaded him to be courageous in all occasions, and promised to be with him, and to assist him in his words, when he was to persuade men, and in his deeds, when he was to perform wonders. He bid him also to take a signal of the truth of what he said, by throwing his rod upon the ground, which, when he had done, it crept along, and was become a serpent, and rolled itself round in its folds, and erected its head, as ready to revenge itself on such as should assault it, after which it became a rod again as it was before. After this God bid Moses to put his right hand into his bosom. He obeyed, and when he took it out it was white, and in color like to chalk, but afterward it returned to its wonted color again. He also, upon God's command, 
took some of the water that was near him, and poured it on the ground, and saw the color was that of blood. Upon the wonder that Moses showed at these signs, God exhorted him to be of good courage, and to be assured that he would be the greatest support to him, and bid him make use of those signs, in order to obtain belief among all men, that, Thou art sent by me, and dost all things according to my commands. Accordingly I enjoin thee to make no more delays, but to make haste to Egypt, and to travel night and day, and not to draw out the time, and so make the slavery of the Hebrews and their sufferings to last the longer. Moses having now seen and heard these wonders that assured him of the truth of these promises of God, had no room left to disbelieve him. He entreated him to grant him that power when he should be in Egypt, and besought him to vouchsafe him the knowledge of his own name. And since he had heard and seen him, that he would also tell him his name, that when he offered sacrifice, he might invoke him by such his name in his oblations. Whereupon God declared to him his holy name, which had never been discovered to men before, concerning which it is not lawful for me to say any more. Now these signs accompanied Moses, not then only, but always when he prayed for them, of all which signs he attributed the firmest assent to the fire in the bush, and believing that God would be a gracious supporter to him, he hoped he should be able to deliver his own nation, and bring calamities on the Egyptians. End of Book 2, Chapters 10-12